focus on hitting your goals in every area of your business. Remember, the universe rewards the bold. A leader has to take the risks. Welcome to Wealth on the Beach podcast. My name is Daniel Lonzo, and again, I am your host, bringing you some of the greatest minds on planet Earth. We're talking about money, we're talking about business, we're talking about wealth, we're talking about building massive, passive residual income. And I'm so excited today, uh, I can't even tell you, I've been waiting for this for such a long time. Sharon Lecter is one of my heroes, okay? So I'm gonna give her a proper introduction. She's an entrepreneur, uh, author, philanthropist, international speaker, uh, she's a CPA, uh, she's a, a, a chartered global management accountant, and most importantly, a mother and grandmother, which she's a great grandmother, by the way. Uh, a lifelong education advocate. She's the founder of CEO of Pay Yourself, uh, Pay Your Family First, a financial education organization regor regarded as a global expert in financial literacy. And we're going to be talking about money today for sure. So if you want to know about money and how to get educated when it comes to money, stick around. Uh, and um, she's, of course, the co-author of international bestseller, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and has released 14 other books, wow, 14 other books in the Rich Dad series. Sharon is recognized globally as an expert on the topics of financial education and entrepreneurship. Whew, that was a lot of stuff, but let me tell you something. She is an amazing human being, and uh, I am, I've always been so inspired by her. So Sharon, Tell me, how good is life right now for you? Well, Daniel, it's wonderful. Obviously, there are a lot of things going on in the world that have caused a lot of fear. And so I'm working really hard talking to people about how they can turn that fear into focus to redefine and reset their life. So I'm working harder than ever trying to, as I tell people, don't wait for the light at the end of the tunnel. Become the beacon of light to help others get through this. So... And so you've written 14 books, 14, 15 books. Is that right? I'll sort of 25. The, I 25? Wrote, yeah, 15 in the Rich Dad series. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, so 25 books. Do you have a favorite, like a little baby one that your favorite? Everybody asks me that question, Daniel. And I have several favorites, but it's like asking which child is your favorite. So you um, obviously Rich Dad, Poor Dad has been the, by far the most successful of all the books. And actually it was the first book I wrote. So it's kind of a special thing. But um, in today's world, I think Outwitting the Devil is the book that everybody needs to help you get through the frustration and you know, the fear of death, the fear of poverty, fear of isolation, all of those kind of have crippled all of us. And so you need to figure out how to turn that fear into focus and into action. So that's something that I think is very important today. Of course, my newest book is always my favorite. I have one coming out in July called Exit Rich, which I'm very proud of. And it was picked up by Inc. Magazine in their imprint. So it's going to be fun. But I love all of them. The second book in the Rich Dad series, Cashflow Quadrant, is a really impactful book about how people think about money. So it's a really powerful book as well. So. Well, I love them all. And uh, I just, uh, Outwitting the Devil, no question, that was one of the most impactful books uh, of my life. I mean, I can tell you exactly where I was when I was listening to that audio book. That's how impactful it was to me. I was in Hawaii on a balcony just listening. I, I just could not get enough of it. I mean, it gives me the chills even talking about it. If, you, if you're listening right now, uh, all of you that are listening, you need to go out and get that book right away. It will change your life, um, just the way you think about life. And uh, I, I just, I like the audio, I like the audio book version personally. I know the book, some people just like to read. I like to listen, but man, that was, whoever you got to play the devil, okay? That was kind of... Well, when we decided to do the audio book, I said, we have to have two different actors and I have to approve their voices because the devil's voice is grovelly and you can just feel it. And I've had people call me, Daniel, and say, I had to pull off the side of the road. They were listening to it in their car and they were so impacted by it, they had to pull off. Um, yeah. it is, it's, it's like a radio drama almost. It really is. And, and you really feel like that's the devil. I mean, actually explaining these things and then you're listening. I, I swear, I, I'm not trying to be dramatic here. I have the chills right now. Okay. Like literally the chills right now talking about this because it's so 
uh, impactful and uh, and it gets you, it, it's it's like you could imagine what the devil would really say. I mean, was that hard to write that? Because I, I mean, or to kind of I mean, I know you you helped to like edit it, right? Tell us the story behind that, by the way. Well, it was hidden away for seventy three years. Um, when Napoleon Hill released Think and Grow Rich in 1937, after 25 years of working on it, um, he was frustrated because even though people know what they're supposed to do to be successful, they don't do it. And so he sat down in just a few short months after he released it and wrote Outwitting the Devil. He would have used the word downloaded if it existed back then, because he felt like the book was delivered to him. But it was really about how we let fear stop us. And there's lots of different types of fear. And before February of 2020, I used to say in our society today that fear of criticism, I think, is the most pervasive because everybody's trying to keep up with everybody else and social media makes you know what you're missing out on. Um, but all those things changed when we had a global reset. And in the book, the devil is being interrogated to give up how he controls our minds. And it says in there, my most powerful fears that I can control are the fear of death and poverty. What's been happening in 2020, the fear of death from the virus, poverty, and fear of isolation, trifecta of fear. And most people are paralyzed by it. They want to get in a dark room and pull the covers over their head. And he shows how you can blast through that fear, identify where it came from. Sometimes that fear, particularly if we're going to talk about money, is part of how we grow up. And it's almost subconscious fear. And once you can identify, you can start releasing it. It's such a powerful book. And it has been such a great book for, for common readers today, the, what's happening in the world today. Oh, gosh, I can just, I can see how you're putting that together because, wow, the way that the devil kind of gets us to get fear-based and scared about so many different things, and then we just retreat, we give up. And that's what, like, that's what he wants us to do, right? He wants exactly. us to give up and, you know, quit, right? Yep, yep. And he talked, and, and one of the things that in this book, he takes on every taboo, sex, politics, religion, education, what we eat. I mean, it's like no stone is left unturned. But one of the strongest examples he talks about is your faith, your religion. Were you taught your religion through fear? or were you taught through faith? And it really brought it home to me. I was raised in the Southern Baptist Church. My pastor was, you know, fire and brimstone from the pulpit every Sunday, scared me to death. I was just sure I was not supposed to ever smile again, right? And yet the youth minister taught us the love of Jesus, the love of God, right? The love of life. So I, I it, it hit home because I had both my religion taught both through fear and faith. And I think once you see that, you say, wow, starts defining things that happen to you as an adult, that you have these subconscious reactions. You go, where did that come from? Well, it's programmed, it's, it's deep inside of you. And once you can recognize, you can get rid of it. Pretty powerful stuff. So let's, let's dive, I, I wanna kind of go back with you a little bit and I wanna find out where you started, where were you born and what did your parents do? Well, I was um, born in San Diego. We left there when I was six months old because I'm a Navy brat. My dad was in the Navy. He retired in Chicago. He had a third grade education, but ended up teaching the engineering school for the Navy. So pretty, pretty smart dude, self-taught. My mother, um, neither one of them had high school graduations. Um, and so they, they both, their dream was that their daughters would get college education. So my sister and I were the first generation to go to college. We lived in a little tiny house between my mother's beauty shop and my father's used car lot. We owned rental properties that I had to scrub out the bathrooms between tenants. I hated it. We had orange groves. So I grew up in this total entrepreneurial home. I swore I would never be an entrepreneur. I wanted to get this sophisticated professional career where I could, you know, go become a partner and retire with a gold watch, right? Gold Rolex. And so I started my career as a CPA, one of the first women hired um, in the Southeast United States and was on a very fast track, enjoying life. And yet at 25, I was working 80 to 100 hours a week. And I went, this is crazy. I'm working for someone else. My pay doesn't change, right? This is crazy. All of a sudden, my parents started looking a whole lot smarter. 
and realize that I grew up in this environment of knowing that the trick to financial freedom is not on wages, it's on assets. My favorite word on earth, assets. Buying, building, or creating income producing assets. And so about that same time when I got frustrated, one of my clients called me with an invitation to join him. He was acquiring a company where I'd own a piece of the rock. So I still remember sitting on my bed in my, in my condo with the old yellow legal pad, pros and cons. I could argue both sides. It didn't help me a bit. But my hand kind of just took off and wrote across the top of the page, why not? Why not do something different? Why not take a risk? Why not go the path less traveled? So I made that decision then to go ahead and leave public accounting, a very lucrative career, and go into entrepreneurship. And I've never looked back. And that was a lot of years ago. <laughs> and so, I mean, what was it about? Was it, did you always have a little bit of a fascination with money and financial education and things like that? Did that kind of start as a young girl? Yeah, I think, I mean, the lessons I was taught as a child was um, half of everything I got, whether it was birthday money or gifts or when I would do chores, half of it went into my savings account. So I got into this like thought process of don't spend everything you earn. And then as I um, was in accounting, I started seeing um, out there auditing all these companies. I saw how companies were doing things right, the inner systems of those companies. But probably even more importantly, I saw how a lot of companies really screwed it up, didn't do things right. And so that wealth of knowledge made me understand that if I truly wanted to create success in my life, I needed to have an asset, a business that would do that. You know, the wealthy people around the globe, no matter what langu language they speak, no matter what their address is, they have one thing in common, income producing assets, their economic engines. And so I realized people didn't understand that. Today, people still don't understand that. And so I, you know, I started a, a woman's magazine, then I started the talking children's book industry. And then my oldest son went off to college and got into credit card debt. I was so devastated that I was mad at him, but I was more mad at myself. And that was December of 1992. And that's when I dedicated the rest of my career to financial education. Because with everything that's going on in the world today, the one thing the only thing that will allow us to level the playing field for every child is to teach them about money in school. You've heard the saying, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. That's because we learn it at home. So I'm, on, I'm passionate, I'm as passionate today as I was December of 92, that we need to get financial education in our school system. And so the, the school system, let's talk about that because, I mean, there is this. That's why my hair is white. Yeah, I, I know. The, the school system just drives me crazy because there's so much money, Sharon. Come on, let, let's just be honest here. I mean, there are billions and billions and billions of dollars being fed into this system that, you know, there's something kind of wrong with the system that we keep, the, the kids keep coming out and they're failing and they're keep making the, they keep making the same exact mistakes, but yet nobody's in there fixing it. Like, what's going on? Well, Outwitting the Devil, which was written in 1938, Napoleon Hill has several pages of things we could do to make the school system better. And they all still need to be done. You know, if you think about the, the, the root word education, educati means to pull out, not drill in, right? And allow our children to have that entrepreneurial endeavor. Keep them curious, keep them creative. Instead, we tighten them down and we teach them conformity. And so we turn off their creative juices. And that's what we have to pay attention to. Particularly, it takes forever to get the school system to change. And the reason is the people making the decisions don't want change. You know, it's not that the, there are a lot of individual teachers who want to bring financial education. They see the need. So I'm, this is not a negative comment about the teachers. It's, a lot of it's the teachers unions or the administrators. We don't want to put any more work on the teachers. I'm going, wait a minute. I think the goal is supposed to graduate children who can be educated to, and prepared. Let's think about them first, right? What do they need? And it's just, it's, it's been a battle I've been fighting a long time, but I'm not. What's, 
Yeah, what, what's interesting, and, and, and Sharon, I'm, I'm with you, and I'm going to fight the fight with you, okay, because I am completely all in with the idea that the system needs to be changed. I mean, first of all, let's, let's talk about this. I mean, a, a teacher, shouldn't they be financially educated too? I mean, so, even, so just the fact that we're going to put some more load on their plate, okay, is not only going to help the kids but it's going to help them too. Cause but, I mean, I, and that, that is the excuse they use. Daniel. Yeah. They use the excuse. Um, the teachers aren't qualified to teach it. And I'm going, we'll teach them. Exactly. The teachers need it just as much as the students. That's it. like wake up and smell the roses. It's not working the way it is. You know, right. we teach our kids about condoms in school, but we don't teach them about money. It's crazy. It is the weirdest that. thing. And, and, and in my 24 years of educating people about money, I mean, think about this. I mean, I sit down with a teacher that is teaching children and they have no life insurance. They have no financial organization. They have no budget in place. They have no, they don't even know what a mutual fund is. They have no sort of emergency fund. So they are completely just oblivious to the things that they're supposed to do in their own life. And so think about it. A teacher that is not financially educated, they're more stressed out, mm -hmm. which means that they can lash out, probably don't do their job as well as they possibly could because yeah, they're, they're stressed, stressed out. They're, they're stressed, stressed out. out. Yeah. yeah. And when it comes to money, you're either a master of your money or a slave to it. And we have far too many people who are slaves to it. And that exact example, Daniel, people put their head in the sand. They don't want to find out how bad it is. But you know what happens? If they take that first step, meeting with you or finding out how bad it is, they're actually going to feel empowered because at least they did something. And my dad used to say, you can't, uh, your map doesn't help you if you don't know where you are and where you want to go. You can't get to where you want to go if you don't know where you are today. So find somebody that can sit down and help you look through where you are to determine, you know, and maybe the picture isn't as bleak as you think it is, but you just worried yourself sick. And it's like, if you think about money when you're laying down at night and you're stressed about it, you need to do something. It's the end of the day. Could, could it be a little bit of ego going on though too? I mean, could that be an issue sometimes where people don't want to know where they're at? Because they, they're like, well, I don't want to know where I'm at, so I don't have to be I'm upset with myself spending. that I blew yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, tomorrow. It's, it's tomorrow. The, you know, tomorrow I'll deal with it. Yeah, that's, that's a huge issue in keeping up with the Joneses. Back in 08 and 09, I, you know, I live in a very nice neighborhood like you do. And many of my neighbors I knew were upside down, about to lose their homes. But yet they'd still show up at fundraisers in town with a new dress and tuxedo, acting like everything was okay. I mean, and that's... That's that mentality of fake it till you make it. And it's like, wait, just be real, be real, get the, the help you need. And you're right. A lot of people will go to virtual resources because then they don't have to actually look at somebody face to face um, that they have to admit that they screwed up. And it's something like, but that's why we're here. We're here to support you. We're here to give you that lifeline to get you from financially disturbed to financially capable and then from financially capable to financially free. It is a process. And if anybody tells you you can do it with you overnight, run the other way. It's a step at a time, having little wins. Oh, I love that. I love that. And so, I mean, were you, I mean, growing up, um, were you a good kid? I always like to ask this question. Well, I was the wild one of the two girls, but um, okay. I was, I was, I was a straight A student. So I, I thought I was a wonderful kid. My parents thought I was the wild one. So I like to have fun. Okay. All right. And did you have a mentor growing up? Like, did you have that first mentor? Well, my dad, my dad would have been my strongest mentor. He, you know, basically said, I didn't even know about the fact that women weren't supposed to do everything men did. I was told I could do anything I wanted to. The fact that I was the only woman in a lot of my math classes and accounting classes, I thought that was interesting. Um, but you know, it's like if I wanted it, I, would, I might have to work a little harder for it. And that was kind of what I accepted that. So it's something that, and that's what we need more girls to understand that you, you, we need to encourage young girls that they can be anything they want to and that they don't need to be channeled into different industries. 
if they if they want to be in STEM, they want to be in robotics, go for it. So. And so, I mean, I, I, I think about it right now. I mean, the world is changing in so many different ways. And one of those ways is women of the world. I mean, like, has there ever been a better time to be a woman in the world? I mean, this is like a great time, right? I mean, back in the 70s, it was James Brown singing, it's a man's world. But I, I can tell you right now, this is a woman's world. I mean, do you agree with that kind of? Yeah, we've had, you know, obviously we're going through a lot of changes in the world right now, but one of those social changes is the fact that, I think it's on the last time I looked at us, over 40% of households, a woman is a primary breadwinner. That's a huge dynamic change from generate the generation before. And so with that comes, um, you know, adjustments from a standpoint of social responsibility, um, managing that, all right, egos, right, egos come into play. And so, but women, Warren Buffett says, the future of the world depends on women coming to the table. Because, and I, I wrote Think and Grow Rich for Women, which I loved, but it was, I wrote it because I was frustrated because women were out there complaining all the time about these men that were in their way. I go, you know, there's something called the law of attraction. When you complain and criticize them, what are you attracting? Uh, you're not gonna get positive change. So let's change the dialogue and start celebrating the progress that women have made. And more importantly, let's celebrate the men who celebrate us, the ones that open the door. And when we start celebrating the progress that's been made, we'll get more, more progress more quickly than if we start just keep complaining and criticizing. Is there more work to be done? Of course. But my message is I love working with men. I think it's our greatest outcome is when men and women together are at the table and create the best outcomes because then you have the expertise of both genders ready to drive forward. Is a lot of is the challenge with a lot of women is it just that self doubt or is it just the way that they were raised that they just have less confidence in in some cases is that what happened? Yeah, Daniel, only 1.7% of women-owned businesses make over a million dollars a year. That's one of the things I'm dedicated to changing. And I think, you know, obviously when you generalize anything, you get in trouble. But I think absolutely one of the biggest things is a lack of confidence. And a guy usually doesn't have trouble saying, I'm an expert. Even I, for many years, would just say, I'm pretty good at it. I felt like a little arrogant if I'd say I'm an expert. You know, I can tell you today, I am a global expert. I am the global expert. I am the authority, right? More women need to stand in their own power and, and that's gonna help them succeed. The other thing is women feel like they have to do it on their own. And you know, the, the greatest success is that power of association. I value our association tremendously and I'm always honored to, to be with you. And that power of association is a beautiful thing, particularly in today's world. That's how you get ahead. Business is a team sport. Have people on your team who are strong where you are weak. Have people who want you to succeed. Who are you hanging out with? Nine times out of 10, when I take on a new mentoring client, it's that power of association and their faith in themselves that are areas that they really need to work on. And we really drill, drill, drill into it and say, okay, who do you hang out with? Um, have, when was the last time you went to a new group and a new organization to talk about what you do? Let's see where we can expand your reach and find people that can align with you and support you. So that was there, I mean, where did you learn that stuff? I mean, from, uh, you know, did you just decide like, because to me, that, that is like something so foreign for most people. Like they just don't want to, they want to stay in this little comfort zone. They don't want to, uh, you know, be out with different people. They don't want to meet new people. They don't want to make new friends. I mean, because it is a little bit scary when, when maybe you don't have as much confidence and to be able to meet somebody new. And so how, does, how do women out there, because, well, let, let me just ask this first. I mean, how do, how do women do that a little more effectively? Well, I think part of it, and this is, you know, it's going to sound trite, but, you know, go with a girlfriend, go with a, a male friend, don't go alone. You'll be more powerful if you're not by yourself. Um, you know, and you asked me how I learned it. Well, being in public accounting, you meet different people all the time because you're in there learning. So you learn how to get to know people. You learn how to find the problems and, um, and successful businesses solve problems and serve needs. So that was fantastic training for me to be able to um, engage with somebody that I didn't know. 
but it was, and then I started the Woman's Magazine, and of course, we were dealing with lots of different um, industries, and I learned a lot about publishing. But when I started with a talking book company with the inventor, is when we said, you know, we have this new technology, we're talking 1987, and parents don't know us, and kids have never had technology. And so how can we get them to trust us? And we didn't want to have years of having to build our brand integrity. So we aligned with Disney, Warner Brothers, Sesame Street, and that helped us explode this in a global way. We had books all over the world because parents trusted them. A few parents weren't happy with us because we made a lot of noise in their homes, but the kids really got back into reading and loved it. So, and we went from 1 million to 9 to 23 and 52 million in the fourth year when we sold the company. So I understood the power of playing big and taking what you know into a bigger distribution channel. But we also wrote really big royalty checks. So I said, next time I build a company, I want to take the time to build the brand that other people want to align with. And so we put that process in place at Rich Dad and we grew that globally, but we didn't have to invest a lot of money in our company because people like Time Warner Books came to us. We want to help promote your book, Time Life, want to do infomercials. So I continued to play big, but I was now in the driver's seat. I was getting the checks, not writing the checks. And so it's the dynamic of learning these various things through my businesses has allowed me to see those opportunities for other people and to see how they can shift in their own way. But along the way, I just continued to feel so bad because people were still just exchanging time for money. They didn't understand. It's not what you do for your paycheck. It's what you do with your paycheck that's important. And, you know, putting the blinders on and just running faster, getting a second job, getting a credit card, put, you know, starting a business on a 20% credit card. I can't even say it without getting choked up. You know, all of these things are, you know, the reality is a lack of knowledge, lack of education and, and, and false hopes that it's going to work out in the end. You got to take control of yourself, be the CEO of your own life and start making those small shifts that give you big results. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's sad because so many people make so many mistakes that really they didn't have to make. If they would have just called up Sharon Lecter, they would just called up Daniel Lonzo and said, hey, look, how do I do this, right? I mean, it, it's, it's, it really is amazing, this world we live in, because we're all so interconnected more than ever. I mean, come on. I mean, you're in Arizona. I'm in, you know, California. And it's like, we are connected right now. We are having a real conversation. We're bringing this education and this information to people and people have access to that. And so they just have to reach out and ask. And I think I feel very lucky because I got in business at 21, Sharon. I was financially independent by the time I was 28, all because I had a mentor. He told me all the things to do right. He, all, he told me all the things not to do. And so I avoided so many of those pitfalls. And so do, do you agree with that? How oh, important the that stats is? are there. The, the, they've done the surveys, the Catalyst Organization. They've got the, the stats that businesses and business owners that have mentors are, are number one, stay in business longer and are um, more successful, even bottom line, better than people who don't have mentors because that's that you know in today's world speed to market is so important a mentor is going to be someone that can open a door for you open their network help you steer around those pitfalls you know um i heard a saying a couple of months ago um, a smart person learns from their mistakes absolutely a genius learns from other people's mistakes and so when you have a mentor they're going to help you learn from the mistakes they made so you don't repeat them and they're gonna speed your way to success. And that's why mentorship is so important. It's one of my greatest joys. I mean, people say, Sharon, why are you still working so hard? And I go, well, my joy is when I see someone I'm working with have, have a win and have success. And that's so, I mean, that's the, if we continue helping each other, we'll, we see a whole lot better world out there. So. All right, so you talked about mistakes. You know, we've all made them. We've made a lot of mistakes. So I wanna know from you, give me a big one. Well, I've got a couple, but I'll start with one. It's still my largest business mistake. You know, I just told you the story about the client who called me and I left public accounting. The company I went to with him had been in bankruptcy. We were buying it out of bankruptcy. 
And within a few months, or actually a few weeks, I found all kinds of corruption. I'm saying, oh my gosh, I have my CPA certificate. I'm going to lose it in my first year. I thought, oh my gosh. So I ran away to uh, figure out what to do with my life. And I came back and met a young man who was there, an attorney. Um, the company had been involved in some lawsuits. And he was actually in my desk chair. I came in my office and we shook hands. It was love at first sight. And that was Michael Lecter. We're celebrating 40 years of marriage this year. So Napoleon Hill said, out of every adversity, every defeat comes a seed of an equal or greater benefit. I got instant feedback. My worst business mistake, my best business choice, or life choice. So um, not, not always do we get such immediate feedback, but that one was. <laughs> that was a good one. That was yeah. a really good one. <laughs> Had I not decided to leave and go there, I would never have met him. So, And, and so what? Tell me, is there anything else when you think about mistakes that either you made or mistakes that you see? Because you've coached and you've mentored so many thousands of people through the years. And so are there common things that you see or, or maybe tell us about maybe something that happened to you? Well, I think you kind of already alluded to it. It's the fact that people know what they're supposed to do, they just don't do it. There's that lack of action. And a lot of that lack of action comes from the, from the, the lack of self-confidence. I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not an expert. And that's that devil, that negative thinking, that small talk in your brain. And that's why it's so important to have a mentor and to have people around you who want you to succeed because that, that voice is going to be there at times. But when you've got that kind of support network, it drowns it out. And you go, wow, yes, let's do this. Let's go for it. Taking action. You know, you hear that word a lot, right? Just do it. Just do it. Take action. Well, the issue is people don't. They just let things get complacent and they get comfortable and they keep doing the same thing over and over again. And all of a sudden there's a crisis in their life and they're thrown into chaos. And the way to get out of it is to become curious and creative again. You know, when was, I always ask people, when was the last time you did something for the first time? And most people kind of get a blank look on their face and they can't answer. And so I say, I challenge them. I go, you need to add excitement and creativity and curiosity in your life. Even if it's just going to a new museum, right? Do something for the first time. You'll feel younger. You'll feel happier. You'll be more creative. And you'll realize that there's more to life than just doing the same thing every day. Yeah, it's, it, it really is interesting because, I mean, we recruit people from 18 years old up to 80, you know, I mean, literally in, in our business. And it's so much, it, it, it's so awesome when you see somebody 70 years old and they're, they try something new and they're like, and they're doing it and they're actually succeeding and they're having, but just the joy to know that life is not over at 50 or 60 or even 70, you know, you have so much life left. They, they say that if you are 50 years old and you don't smoke, you're going to live to like a hundred years old. I mean, most people are going to live to a hundred. So it's like, what a, we have such a, a, an amazing life ahead. Why would we not go for it? Like, and, and look, what do we got to lose? We got one life to live on this earth. We might as well play big, like the Sharon Lecter play big movement, right? And, and so we might as well go for it. So, hey, Sharon, how do we play bigger? And tell us about, uh, explain to us about what assets are and liabilities and give us a little bit of that uh, understanding, that financial education that people can leave here with. Sure, let me see. I think I might actually have something from a prior interview. Um, my second book with the Rich Dad series is called The Cash Flow Quadrant, and this is the, the, the visual, all right? And what on the left side of the quadrant stands for E and S, employee and self-employed. This is what we go to school for. School teaches us to be a good employee. School teaches us to be a doctor, lawyer, speaker, whatever, all right? That's you exchanging time for money. A dollar per hour commission, you working hard. The right side is businesses that you own, investments that you own, and that's where other people are working for you, other people's time, other people's resources, other people's um, money, all right? And this is where you wanna sit, look at yourself and say, where is my money coming from? As I said before you, I still make money out of all four quadrants. I'm an employee of my own company. 
I'm a speaker, so sometimes I get paid for speaking. Businesses, I own multiple businesses, and I have lots of investments. My husband and I make far more money on the right side. Now, there's a finite amount of money you can make on the left side of the quadrant because there's only so many hours in the day, only so many days in the week. The amount of money you can make on the right side, infinite. And this is where the assets are found and they're economic engines. It's like they're an employee for you. Once you buy, build, or create an asset and you put it in your balance sheet, it's an employee without the HR problems. It's just generating revenue for you 24 seven. And so what I do, my superpower is helping people identify how to move to the right side, how to create those assets that become economic engines to create the life that you deserve. And that's what you did by the age of 28. You had systems and things generating cash flow for you. So you could have cho chosen to stop working. You didn't because you're passionate about what you do. I haven't quit. I'm a lot older than you are, 66. And I almost thought about retiring. I, I, I can't do that. I'm still here for a reason. There's more for us to do. Oh, what an inspiration you are to so many people. Because I see people at 50, Sharon, at 50 years old, they think life is over. They're like, I'm done. What else is there to do? I retired. I'm, I'm getting my little, you know, pension or whatever. And, I, you know, I was able to retire at 55 or whatever somebody will say. And, and I'm like, this is where your life gets, this is like where it should all begin right now. Like this should be the most exciting time of your life. So number one, you get out of your house, stop watching TV, get off the couch, go do something, meet somebody new, make a new friend. Cause you have total freedom, right? Like, like you don't have to work for food anymore. So you have all the time in the world to go play big, to go make all of your dreams come true. And I think most importantly, Sharon, impact somebody else's life. I mean, us that's sitting that's exactly. watching lots of Netflix is not making anybody's life better. Would you agree? Yeah, that's the whole reason I formed the Play Big Movement because, you know, you talk about mistakes. Well, there's also things that happen in our life that stop us in our tracks. It could be a death, a divorce, a financial setback. And seven and a half years ago, I lost my youngest son. I was at the height of my success, but you talk about put, being put in neutral. I was literally just coasting. I didn't have any highs, I had lots of lows, and I just wasn't feeling good about life. Um, you're not supposed to outlive your children. And so about three years ago, I said, you know, I really should just retire. I mean, it's just, I'm, just not get, I'm just not feeling it right now. And I got a lot of pushback from family and friends. And I even think I got a little pushback from him. I could hear him in my ear, you know, get over it, mom. There's more for you to do. And that's my message to everybody. And particularly what's happened in 2020 with the craziness. We've all had stuff in our life that has stopped us in our tracks. And we have a choice. We can choose to let it disable us, um, try and hide under the covers for, in fear. Or we can choose to take that fear, turn it into focus and have the faith to move forward because my message to you is the same message that I heard in my ear. You're still here for a reason and there's more for you to do. And to what you just said, Daniel, time is our only precious resource. We can make money, lose it and make it back. We can fall in love, stay in love or not, find someone else to love, but we don't get the time back. And it's so important that we value the fact that we're here for a reason. And growing up as a little girl, my father would ask me each night, Sharon, have you added value to someone's life today? And that's, he's been gone 14 years, but I still ask myself that every night. Have you, I added value to someone's life today? And life is so much more worth living when you know you've made a contribution. And so when I made the decision not to retire, I said, okay, I'm going to play big again. Because my career had been with playing with Disney, Warner Brothers, all, Time Life. And then all of a sudden I wasn't, I was playing small. I was okay, I made the commitment. I'm not done yet, I have more to do. And when I made the decision to play big again, amazing things happened. And I wanted to share that with people so that everybody plays a bigger game. And that's why I have the private Facebook group called the Play Big Movement with Sharon Lecter. And I have broadcasts there every week and we have some courses that help people play bigger. That's not my intent with you today, but it's always to provide that support to people to play that bigger game. And when I made that decision, you know, I got the invite to be on the, um, 
the get motivated stages with Susie Orman. And then I got invited to be in the Think and Grow Rich, the legacy movie to be featured in that. And then this year, earlier this year, and you may not even know this, Daniel is one of 13 people highlighted in the World's Greatest Motivators television series. And so you can go to worldsgreatestmotivators.com forward slash episode eight, eight for abundance is mine. But I'm, I'm on there with my dear friends, you know, Les Brown, Jack Canfield, Brian Tracy, uh, Mary Morrissey, Lisa Nichols. What an honor to be included in that incredible group. And so, but it was because I opened myself to the possibilities. Too many of us have blinders. We have things right there ready for us. We can't see them. Basically, we're walking through the world with our head in the sand or on blinders. And that's, I like to help people blast away the blinders and see those opportunities and seize them. Well, you are doing an amazing job doing that. Uh, I, I think we could do this for another three hours, okay? Uh, because I, I love Sharon Lecter. I mean, honestly, Sharon, you've brought so much value to my life personally. And I just, I encourage everybody on, you know, listening. Thousands and thousands of people are going to be listening to this podcast or YouTube video. And I just want all of you to know that she's the real deal. I mean, I've, I've got, got the privilege to spend time with Sharon at her house and did my podcast with her uh, last year. And I just, I really feel like you are bringing so much hope to so many people, but people have to also understand that, you know, to do it at 66 years old, to say, you know what? I got a lot of value to bring. I got a lot of good stuff I want to bring. And, 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 there's a lot of young people that are inspired by you and without you, they're going to have less financial education, which at the end of the day, come on, let's be honest, right? When we have financial education and we have financial abundance and we have assets and we have passive residual income coming in or passive income coming in, I mean, we get to give more money. We get to spend more time with our families. We, we get to travel more. We get to experience the juice. I call it the juice of life. And so it, it's just awesome. Yep. So, so and I want to encourage of all choice. of you. And, and the, the power, power of choice. Power of choice. You know, when, yeah. you, when you are financially stressed and just, you know, and you're worried somebody's going to come get your car out of the parking lot, it's hard to live life with a smile on your face. And so get, just get rid of those binds, get rid of the shackles, because you can do it. I mean, Daniel can show you how to do it. I can show you. Take the step and just ask for a hand up, not a handout, a hand up. Because one step at a time, I have, I have one gal that went through one of my courses and, you know, in three months, she was able to get rid of $70,000 worth of bad debt. You know, that makes me so proud and so happy. It's worth everything I do to know that I've helped somebody get past that point and feel the shackles of bad debt just releasing. So. People need freedom. They need to get free. And uh, Sharon, you, I know you're going to help so many more people in the rest of your journey. And so I, I, you know, on behalf of everybody, thank you so much for your time, for your wisdom, for all of your books. I mean, look, it's a lot of hard work you've put in, in all these years. And I want to thank you because it's people like you that make this world a better place to live and a more fun place to live. And so thank you for that. I want everybody to go follow Sharon. She's on Instagram. She's on Facebook. She's on Twitter. She's on YouTube. She's on everywhere. And, and again, just Google search her. Um, get one of her books today. I don't care which one. Go get one of her books today. Say, say to yourself, look, with all of this wisdom, if I can learn just some of the things that she's teaching, I can make a little bit of progress. Doesn't mean she's gonna give you the get rich quick scheme overnight. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a real fundamental difference in your mind, change of thinking to get you to think about money in a different way, think about assets in a different way so that you can get your family financially free. So Sharon, you're so sweet. Thank you so much. You know, and if they order their books through my website, SharonLector.com, and they put a note on there that it's from your show, Daniel, I'll personally um, autograph them before we ship them out. So love that. All right, you're, you're gonna you're gonna have to autograph a lot of books because there's gonna be a lot of books sold today. So make sure you mention my name. With that said, I just want to remind all of you to dream bigger than ever, but make sure you get after it and do it now. God bless you. I'll see you at the top.